my darkness, Jesus found me, touched mine eyes and made me see. love of Christ my Lord divine that made him stoop to save a soul like mine through all my days and dead in heaven above my soul will silence never I'll worship him forever and praise him for his glorious love of Christ my Lord divine that made him stoop to save a soul like mine through all my days and then in heaven above my soul will silence never I'll worship him forever and praise him for his glorious love my soul will silence never I'll worship him forever and praise him for his glory Amen. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 3. You say, Preacher, when are you ever going to get out of Philippians chapter 3? Hopefully next week. Amen. But uh, I've enjoyed every bit of it. And um, I do not apologize for preaching the Word of God. Amen. It's line upon line, verse upon verse. And I preached this the first service in 2018. And the Holy Spirit told me, you're skipping the whole chapter for three words. And those three words were, of course, count in verse 8, Philippians chapter 3. That's the right values. Press, that's Philippians 3.14. That's the right vigor. And then, of course, we look, verse 20, which I thought I was going to preach on this morning, but it'll be tonight. That's the right vision. If you don't have the right values, you won't have the right vision. If you don't have the right values, you won't have the right vigor. You'll end up spending all your life on sports or money or uh, recreation or work. And all those are uh, admirable things, but they don't come first. They shouldn't come first. If we have the right value, the right perspective of uh, this life. And so the first sermon I preached out of Philippians chapter 3 this year was that summary. And then we went back that night and preached on the purity of the believer. That's verses 1 through 5, or 1 through 6. We ought to have some purity about us. And that means pure focus, pure in heart. So we'll see God. And then we ought to realize that there's some right um, uh, perspective. You know, we ought, we ought to look at things different now that we're saved, say amen. Church should not be a chore, it ought to be a joy. Amen. amen. The Bible ought to be the book. Prayer ought to be the time you spend with the Lord. And I don't believe it will be leftovers, amen? You come to my house, I'll ask my wife not to warm up leftovers, but get something out of the cupboard. It might be a can of soup, praise God, but I'll tell you what, it'll be fresh, amen? It'll be fresh. It won't be leftovers. I don't believe we give our honored guests leftovers. And let, me, let me just say this. I believe that you ought to be excited about worshiping the Lord first, above everything else. And some of you, I've seen you at ball games, you get, you get so excited, you jump up and down and holler. Shout, holler at the referees. That's embarrassing, especially when I'm sitting next to you. And um, um, not that I've, I, I've ever done that, but anyway, I, I, I'm, I, this young gentleman here just got back in Afghanistan. Uh, I coached him as a, as a little boy uh, on a basketball team, Jason. Remember that? A long time ago, many years ago. That's how I met him. That's how I met Brother Stephen Underwood, coached him in, in uh, baseball. I figured if I'm going to have my kids out there, I might as well just be in charge, amen? So I, I enjoyed it. I got to play more, too. No, not really. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a blessing uh, to, you know, get excited about that stuff. But that's just stuff. 
If you get more excited about sports than you do uh, worship, something's wrong in your life. And I get real excited about it. I really do. I mean, if there's two doodle bugs in the sand, I'm going to root for one to beat the other one. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. Cheer them on. But folks, that's not my life. That's not my, that's not my goal. We ought to have some values. And if you want to really read about what the Lord uh, laid on Paul's heart, you read verse 8 about what he thought about. He, he counted as dung all the things that his credentials and reputation. And then we, uh, last, last Sunday, preached on the right, um, the right pursuits. We ought to be ardent in that. That means uh, dedicated. That means we ought to forget those things in the past. Don't let the past poison the present and ruin the future. But this morning, I want to preach on another, uh, and I just alliterated this so you'd remember it. I want to preach on the performance of the believer. You know, it's one thing to be pure and holy, have all your standards right, you know, I mean, just, you know, you can cross your T's and dot your I's just right. But what are you doing with it? You know, you can have conviction and sit on them. You can sit on your blessed assurance, as some preacher said, from the hills of Kentucky, and not do a thing. I believe that we ought to put in practice what we preach. I try to do that. I try to set the example in visitation, in prayer, in faithfulness. I try to set that example. And I try to go the second mile. It's harder to go the second mile than it was a long time ago when we first started the church. But I want to preach, a, I want to preach on one word, but I want to show you this whole text of it in verse 17 through 19. Turn in your Bibles, Philippians 3, 17 through 19. And I want to talk to you about uh, setting a pattern for the next generation. You know, we've got a lot of trouble. By the way, I'm glad God doesn't shut down. Amen. Our government might shut down. But praise God, I'm glad God doesn't shut down. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Amen. I'm glad He's still on the throne. And the government is upon His shoulders. And will be when He comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's read verse 17 through 19. Stand on the word of God. Brethren, be followers together of me. Now that's kind of brass. For somebody to say, hey, just follow me. But I believe, as he said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Follow me as I follow Christ. That does some authority to it. Gives it some. And mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. And mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. I want you to underline and circle in your heart the word ensample. We're going to dwell in there a lot today. It says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now I tell you even with weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Anybody adds works to salvation is an enemy of the cross. Now here it is. To whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and, who glory in their, and whose glory is in their shame, who mine earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Father, thank you, God, that you are a great example. And God, that we're following you and not following man. And God, this is not my church just because I started it. It's your church, and I take my hands off of it. It's your church, God. I'm your under-shepherd. I'm your servant. And I thank God for the privilege of being in my first pastorate these 40 years. But Lord, I thank you, dear God, for the good staff, and I thank you, God, for my good family that's been such a blessing and help to me. And for these good deacons and these good people, that God's been a good example for the next generation. Now the next generation's come up. And God, if they're going to be faithful, then the next generation will be faithful. So God, help us not to drop the baton in this relay race of life and ministry. God, it's not a sprint, it's not a marathon, it's a, it's a, it's a relay. And God, somebody's following us, and as I've said often to someone, we're the best Christian they know. And so, dear God, help us to be real. Help us to be right. Help us to be faithful. And help us to be a good ensample, Lord, for your glory. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I love to go to Sam's Wholesale Company um, for one reason. Because there's a ribbon loin up the street. No, not really. Uh, and a lot of people want to go shopping, but I like to go there sometimes and just get out of town and go shopping. And I don't like to shop much, but I like that place. 
And one of the reasons I like that place is they have all these stands set up, and they're samples. You can just eat free, amen? Don't eat before you go to Sam's. Just start taking sausages on a toothpick and cheese on a toothpick and go to the dessert and take a little of that, you know. And, you know, I was thinking the other day, wonder if those things were stale. What if those things were rotten? What if those things were outdated? Now, who would buy the product? And I'm saying today, friend, we're an ensample. We're to be an example of Christianity in our Christian life. We need to not just talk about it with right values, and we don't need to just get pure because we want to be holy, and sometimes it comes across holier than thou. We need to practice what we profess. We need to practice what we teach, and we need to practice what we preach, say amen. And I believe a good example is worth a whole lot of words, say amen. Because sometimes words can be confusing and sometimes words can go over our head. But I'm going to tell you something, friend. You can't discount a good pattern. I mean, just a good pattern. My mama, she was a great seamstress and she'd always have patterns laid out all over the place. And I thought, how in the world is she cutting all this stuff out and it's going to come together as a dress or or for me, some pants. I mean, we were kind of old-fashioned back then. We even had homemade clothes, amen? I like homemade milk, and I mean, not homemade milk, homemade bread and homemade buttermilk biscuits, and I don't like those canned stuff where you crack it open, it explodes, and you put it in the oven and call that biscuits. I like the homemade stuff, say amen? Well, I had homemade clothes when I was a kid, amen? But it started with a pattern, and those patterns came together. Folks, I want you to notice in verse 19, or 17, it says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as ye have us for an example. Now there was a lot of Epicureans, and there was a lot of other people, Gnostics, and there was a lot of people in this generation today that called themselves Christians, but they were, they were living according to the pattern of the world. In other words, if it felt good, they did it. And it was sensual. And that's why he said that you ought not let your God be your belly. And that belly also talked about the whole lower extremities and the inward heart. And folks, I want to tell you something. This world was sex crazy. This world even worshipped uh, the goddess of sex. And, and folks, it was a wild day that Paul lived in. And he said, oh friend, the shame of minding earthly things and the shame of having your God be your belly or fleshly, sensual appetites. Now, friend, don't we live in a day like that? I'm telling you, friend, it's crazy out there, isn't it? All these things coming out about ball players and politicians and uh, about uh, uh, their uh, abusing women, and, and I think they ought to get caught, and they ought to be out of the picture, and I believe you ought to have not, not even the appearance of evil. Amen? Uh, these gymnasts need to have uh, ladies uh, trainers taking care of them, saying amen. Right there, amen. I don't think a man should even be in that position, amen. But I want to tell you, friend, all this is coming out, all the scandals, all the things that's happening, folks, and it's just conducive of our society that we're in a mess, amen. And we have low standards, and people say if it feels good, do it. And folks, I want to tell you something. The Bible says if it's in this book, do it. Can somebody say amen? And I want to tell you something. I think we ought to rally to the cause of just walking the walk and not just talking the talk. I believe that we ought to uh, profess what we preach and profess what we teach and pro profess what we claim to be Christians. That means Christ-like. Amen? And I'll tell you something, Paul lays it on the line as a pattern. And this word in sample interests me. And the folks, I want to tell you something, this word in sample in the Greek means this. It means an impression left by a sword. It means hammer, ham, uh, uh, an impression that's left by a hammer. You know, you ever seen a little dent in your thumb when you're holding the nail? Amen, that'll hurt. Amen. It means an impression, listen, it's this, this, even, even, even get deeper than that. It means an impression left on someone through your fist. I mean, you make an impression on them. In other words, you make an indention in their life. And folks, that's a strong word. You ought to be an ensample. I want to say this, friend, you either impress people for the Lord or for yourself. Or you impress people for the Lord or this world. I don't want to be impressive and be in the hall of fame of faith. And as the Sunday school lessons have been so pungent, I don't want the applause of the world. I want the applause of God. Say amen. 
I think it's all right to encourage each other. I think it's all right to, uh, uh, you know, thank each other for their, your faithfulness. And Wednesday I got all nostalgic and teary-eyed and expressive and just got all enthused about being in a little room packed out and ha- preaching behind the original pulpit that's always had the King James Bible preached behind it and just got sort of sentimental with y'all. And I'm sorry, I do this once a year and I'm particularly doing it in this 40th year because I never thought I'd make it. I never thought I'd be anywhere one place for 40 years. I'm hyperactive, I'm not hyper Calvinist. And I want to tell you something, friend, it's amazing what God has done. And I give Him the credit and the glory for it all, but I want to tell you something, I believe, and I've set this as a standard, I think I've got a little slack in it lately, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to draw the cords a little tighter, and I'm going to do it out of love. I believe we ought to lead by example. Amen. I believe you deacons, you ought to listen like somebody's looking at you how you listen. I believe you ought to follow. I believe you ought to lead. And I wouldn't give you 10 cents for a preacher that would not follow God and try to lead a flock. I believe you teachers ought to be faithful about reading the Word of God and praying. I believe you ought to be faithful to every service. I believe it sets an example. I believe your students ought to come on Wednesday night and look for you. And they do. Amen? I believe if they come on visitation show up, they ought to look for you to be the example. Folks, we lead by example. We don't lead by constraint. We don't lead by you have to. We don't lead by legalism or, or rules and regulations. We lead as God leads us by example. And folks, if you take the example out of the church, you're going to have a mess and a chaos and the next generation is going to uh, live in excess of what you don't do. We need to walk the walk, amen? Paul's saying that. We ought to be in samples. We ought to make an impression. I didn't mean to do that. We need to make an impression on somebody. Come on, say amen. We ought to be excited about serving God. We ought to really be excited about His Word that's infallible, inspired, and preserved. We preach God's Word, say amen. Now, I don't mean to get too excited because I make some of y'all nervous when I come down off the platform. You think I'm going to sit with you. Maybe I should. But I want to say this, friend. I believe that we ought to have in theos, in God, and folks, not just a bunch of puffed up, man-made rules and regulations and religion and, and, and be, a, uh, be a fan, but we ought to be an ardent follower with some vigor. We ought to press towards the mark of the high calling of God. We ought to have some enthusiasm about our serving God. It don't mean you have to hip-hop and jump and shout. Some of you have never said amen while I preach for 40 years. That doesn't offend me. I wish you would just nod and come back up and say amen. You know, that would be wonderful. Just smile once in a while or just look at your Bible and say, Woo, that is the Bible. Praise God. You don't have to do it loud. You can raise your little pinky to your wife and say, Praise God, I'm shouting now, hon. People got different personalities. You can't tell how much gas is in the tank by the toot of the horn. It's how you hit the ground walking. So it's not how high you jump. It's how you walk when you hit the ground. Say amen. I'm not a shouter. But I sure don't want to be a powder when I come to the house of God. Say amen. Come on now. I know I'm preaching to the choir and they already went down. But I'll tell you this, friend. We need to realize that God has given us a great responsibility to set an example. I want my children to have an example. I've tried to do that religiously. Thank God Jason's around here handling problems, running all over the place, does so much. I appreciate him so much. But folks, when he came to this town, he was an eight-month-old child. He didn't get saved until seven years into this church. Thank God he did. But when we, when, we, when we were expecting, I say we, I didn't carry him, but I felt like I did. In fact, I'm gaining so much work, I feel like I'm having one. They're not really. <laughs> I got to watch it. After the banquet is the diet. Say amen. Praise God. We always have something that's delaying it, Brother Derek. It's always something. You know, after the spring campaign, we'll, be, we'll go on one. <laughs> Y'all stop having so many banquets, but I'm glad you're having this one. But, you know, when, when Connie said, we're expecting. I remember we was over there in Claxton, Georgia, in a little old house, and 
I said, oh, my, we're expecting. I said, let's pray. We hit that coffee table. Didn't hit it. I mean, we knelt beside it. We both weeping. And I remember I prayed, dear God, if we can't be the proper example for this child, we don't need to have this child. But God, we sure want this child. And I claim that it's a boy. That's what I did. I really did. <laughs> I claim it's a boy, my firstborn. He's running around here trying to help unstop commodes or something. I don't know what he's doing. And I dedicated him to the Lord in the womb. But I want to tell you something. It wasn't baby dedication day. It was mom and daddy rededication day. I want to be an example to him. I want to, be, I want to, be a, I want to make an impression on his life. That when I'm kicking up tulips up here in the West Hill Cemetery, if I ever buy a lot, uh, <laughs> it's the hardest thing to do is buy a cemetery lot. You just don't want to do it, amen? You know? I just hope he'd maybe come by once in a while and say, you know, he set the example. And I'm going to keep it. And folks, I want you to know it's a priv- privilege and a precious privilege to make an, an example on people's lives, make an impression. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, we're living epistles read of all men. I don't believe in the living Bible. It has cuss words in it. And Brother Jeremy's going to teach us in the next three Sunday nights, or a few Sunday nights from here, he'll start a series for three Sunday nights on why we believe the King James Bible. I mean, the history of it and the root of it and the, and the line of it. And I mean, it's tremendous. It's a tremendous study. He's going to do it all around the nation, I hope. But I want to tell you this, friend. I don't believe in the living Bible, but I believe we ought to live the Bible. Say amen. I don't believe a, that's a Bible at all. It has cuss words in it. Living Bible. But folks, we ought to be a living Bible. Folks, can they read you on the job Monday when everything's going bad? Are you still, are you still faithful when things are going bad? I mentioned about that little baby dying two, two years old. And my prayer is they don't get bitter, Brother Randy. And Jason showed me a track while I was shaking hands. He hasn't been around. He's just come back to us, praise God. The Lord has a way of sending people back to us. He showed me that track, 2001, July 1st, May 5th. I was close. May 5th, 2001. It's, it's my handwriting. Saved and know it. But I want to tell you what led up to that salvation. I preached his little baby's funeral. Now I want to tell you something, friend. I appreciate people that don't quit. I appreciate people going anyway. And a lot of people get bitter and they shake their fist at God and say, God, why? But I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to get saved. You're not saved when tragedy knocks because you can't handle it without Him. Amen. Say amen. How many of you parents could handle it without Him if that happened to you? I couldn't handle it as a grandparent. But I want to tell you something, friend. The example is this. Don't quit. Be faithful. Serve God. No matter what. That makes an impression on people's lives. That's what he's talking about here. They know what Paul's been through. Can somebody say amen? They know what he's been through. He's been hurt and beaten and scourged and whipped and, 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 and made havoc of the church before he was saved. And I'm sure the old past came back like a video recorder that you can't serve God and you shouldn't serve God and you're not qualified to to have a Bible study, and et cetera, and et cetera, et cetera. But Paul said, I forget those things are past, and I press towards the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus. It's a high calling to be an example. It's a high calling to be faithful. First Thessalonians, let's look at a few scriptures, okay? That's what we're here for, to read the Bible and, and, and let the Bible preach. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Real quick now. It says, For our gospel, whoo, time flies. For our gospel came not unto you in word only. Amen. It's not just preaching, not just teaching, not just deacon, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. Don't you like that? Don't make me nervous a bit. Hallelujah. And in much assurance, as you know our manner of men we were among you for your sakes. Look at verse 6 now. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. 
Look at verse 7. 1 Thessalonians, you with me? So that ye were, here it is, in samples to all that bleed in Macedonia and Acadia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. For, before they're sounding out of the word of the Lord, Paul's saying, just be a sample. Be an example. Be faithful. Back up what you say by what, how you live. Amen? Oh, what powerful verses. Don't, go back to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. Philippians 4 verse 9. You with me now? Don't you love to study the word of God? If you don't have your Bible... Uh, you're, you're, you're probably just saying, where in the world is he going? Well, look at the Bible. It says, those things which have both learned and received and heard, now here's the key, and seen in me, what's the next word, class? Do. And the God of peace shall be with you. <laughs> you know what he's saying? You've heard it. You've seen it. I've practiced it. I've tried to live it. Now you do it. Nike's got something about, you know, just do it. I want to tell you something. The Christian life is just live it in God's power and God's strength. You know, the most precious thing you have, Christian, is your testimony. You lose that, you lose a lot. Folks, I want to tell you something. As I was coming up, the devil would tip me, and I'd go and bow myself down in the nursery next to those twins that we had on my birthday. You talk about a great birthday present. Twins, a boy and a girl. And they're in the same church over in Alpharetta. That is really something to me. He's leading singing, and Stephanie's bossing everybody around. No, and she's, and she's, a, she's the assistant pastor's wife and loves the youth and enthusiastic and excited about everything in the church and missions. Hallelujah. I hope I didn't brag too much. But I want to tell you something, friend. If I fell, they probably wouldn't be in the ministry. They probably wouldn't want to serve God. Daddy went out and got another woman. They probably have a bitter taste in their mouth even serving God. Folks, we can't afford to slip up. There's too many little eyes looking up at us. Say amen. I've had some of my heroes fall into sin. And I know we, that, that happens, but I want to tell you something. My greatest hero's never fallen into sin. His name is Jesus. He's the greatest example. Say amen. And folks, he's never let you down, and he'll never shut down. He's still in control. Say amen. Jesus is the one we're following. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 9, just want to drive this point home. Second, now you know why I do series. You better be glad I do series. You'll be here at 3 o'clock. But look at this, 2 Thessalonians 3, 9. What does Paul say? He said this, Not because we have power. Not because we have not power. But to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. He said, I just want to make an impression on your life. Is that, there's anything wrong with impressing your children about the love of God? Is there anything wrong about impressing your children about the faithfulness of God? Is there anything wrong about impressing your children to have the proper heroes and values in life, which are godly heroes and godly values? I don't think there's a thing wrong with that. Now, there's a lot wrong with impressing your children that the heroes are athletes and the heroes are rock stars and the heroes are Hollywood. And whoever your hero is, is their hero. Come on now, I'm preaching. And folks, I believe it's shocking to see that we've almost lost a generation to some heroes that are not very heroic, and not very holy, and not very wholesome. And they got about five or six marriages in Hollywood, and they try to tell you how to, how to keep your family together through their little entertainment scenarios. Don't tell me, friend. I, I was brought up when TV was black and white and they slept in separate twin beds. Amen. <laughs> and Father knew best. And Andy Griffin didn't run off with somebody else. Did he ever get married? I don't know. But anyway, I know Barney tried. But anyway, listen to me. Friend, listen. If you're not careful, 
You'll, you'll, you'll follow the wrong people and the wrong philosophy and the wrong society. Folks, what we need to be is Christians that are pilgrims passing through and, and our, our king is Jesus and our country is heaven and we're ambassadors and we represent our country and we don't blend in with the world and become just sinners saved by the grace of God, but we ought to be saints that are sanctified by the Word of God. I know you won't be perfect, but I'm so tired of people saying, well, if you want saved, you're always saved, and you can't lose your salvation, so you can live like you want to. Wrong. Number one, you don't want to. Number two, you're scared to. Because you don't want to lose your children to the devil. You don't want to, lose, you don't want to be under the chastening hand of God. Say Amen. And you want to have the peace and joy that comes through abiding in Him. We don't live like we want to. We've got to live like well God wants us to. In samples. Let me just close with one verse. With 17 subpoints. No. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 12. That sounds like Steve Gregory. Look at this. Where is he at? He's preaching somewhere. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 12. Here we go now. Young people, tune in here. God bless you. Appreciate the young people. Packed it out Wednesday night in our little meeting. It said, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Folks, I want to tell you something. God has called you to be a pattern, no matter what age you're at, somebody looks up to you. I preach, I've been preaching 36 years at the YDC once a month. I was so sad Tuesday. They canceled it because of snow and ice. Now, folks, that's, that's weak. Yankees, they just keep on going, praise God. We shut the jails down <laughs> when it snows. I said, I understand. I love preaching there, but every time I preach there, I see these cool hand Luke 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds these girls and boys sitting there and scared to death, they're not like the over in the jail where you go every day, Brother Larry, where you were saved at. They ain't learned to be hard yet. They're still scared. And I always look at them and try to challenge them this way. I say, hey, young lady, you got a little sister? Yeah. Men, you got a little brother? Yeah. You want them to come to this place? You want them to be hooked on drugs? I said, I'm going to tell you something. You ought to get saved today. Not only for you to go to heaven and, and get victory over your sin, but you need to get saved for your influence over your little brother or sister. And I want to tell you something. No matter how hard they are, no matter how cold they are, I'm telling you, friend, it touches their heart when they realize they're leading an example for their little brother or sister. Amen, Brother Jeremy. You see it every day over there. And folks, I want to tell you something. To someone, you're the best Christian they know, and Paul put it this way, have the right purity, have the right standards and, and priorities, have the right vigor, but put it to practice. Put shoe leather on your Bible. We ought to be an example in word. Proverbs 15, 1 says, A soft answer turns away much wrath. You know what the world's philosophy is? Duke it out in words. You hurt me, I'll hurt you. And I want to say this, Mom and Daddy. Life's too, too short to fuss and fight all the time in front of your kids. I used to stutter until I was in about third grade because of all the fussing and fighting, living with an alcoholic. And Mama would never let up. And it was, it was, a, it was until he passed out, it was a fuss and a fight. And it drove me crazy. Thank God I'm glad my daddy got saved. But folks, he wasted a lot of years of making me and my sister nervous wrecks because of the disunity and the, and the lack of love and, and just the, the heartache. And then thank God the night the preacher preached on how to win our loved ones and mama got right with God and I got right with God and Diane got right with God. And we stopped preaching and started loving. <laughs> He wasn't listening anyway. He's passing out while we was preaching to him, you know. Amen. But we just started loving him. Three years later, he got saved. And he said, you know what won me the Lord? You and mom and sisters love. 
your forgiveness, your patience. Folks, I believe we ought to love in word, and then we ought to love in conversation. It says, believers, listen, look, I'm, I'm stuck on 1 Timothy 1.12, 4.12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believer in word. You ought to watch what you say and how you say it. Say amen. I have a problem with tone sometimes at home. You know, what's for supper in Jesus' name, amen? You know, <laughs> Just preach a little to your loved one that's, you know, trying to cook a little, amen. Preach to your children a little bit. No, tone, tone, the way you say it. And then most important of all, how you back it up what you say. And then conversation, and you know conversation means citizenship, uh, colonial of believers. It means lifestyle. It means you ought, to, you, ought to, you ought to set an example in conduct. Look at Titus 2, 7. My time's up, but please don't pack up and leave. I'll continue this tonight. I love series. I'll just continue the next service. You say, well, I can't come back. You ought to. Titus chapter 2, verse 7. The Bible says this. In all things, showing thyself a pattern. Here it is, an impression, an ensample of good what? Works. In doctrine, showing incorruptibleness. Gravity, sincerity, sounds peace that cannot be condemned. Oh, friend, listen. We need to realize that we can have the privilege of walking with God in our everyday life and wetting people's appetites. And Folks, I want to tell you something. We're in a dark day. Say amen right there. I mean, the government can't even stay open. They wouldn't agree if Jesus was sitting there. Much less Donald Trump. That other guy, that other lady, good gracious. And folks, here we are. Greatest nation on this earth and we can't keep the government open for disagreeing over dreamers. I hadn't figured that one out yet. I dream all the time. I dream while I'm driving. I dream awake. I'm a dreamer. I don't know all about this stuff. And I ain't going to get political. because One of you will get offended every time. So I keep it out of the pulpit. I just think you ought to vote and back up what, you, what your convictions are. Say amen. Whew, don't get me started on this. But I want to tell you something. You know what our solution is? A city set up on a hilltop cannot be hid. We show forth our works. That's what the Bible says. We ought to be a city set up on a hilltop. We ought to be a light house. We ought to be a light in this dark world. And folks, if there's ever a time to be consistent and faithful and pure and holy and not holier than thou and walk the walk and not just talk the talk and to set an example, in sample, make an impression. Don't hit somebody and make an impression. Don't hit somebody with a sword and make an impression where the Greek word comes from. Is today. Because never has it been darker. Never. Babies are still being murdered. We're in trillions and trillions of dollars of debt. And there's a drug crisis in America that's worse than it's ever been before. It's a dark day. What are we going to do? The Bible says we ought to set an example. Back to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. In conversation, in our citizenship... In our way of life. And then, let me just hurry. We ought to set an example in charity. Amen. You know, folks, there ought to be one thing that people say about our church over these 40 years. They love one another. I'm glad that there's not a group out of this church starting another church. Every church in Dalton, when I started knocking on doors, when I first, I remember when Connie and I were going door to door yesterday, 
I said, boy, this brings back big memories about when we used to go knock on doors and they'd say, what split are you off of? One lady came to the door and said, are you a prat? I said, no, my mother called me a brat, but I don't have a clue what a prat is. I'm serious. That's your local, I ain't going to tell you. Anyway, I ain't got time preaching against that. But I want to tell you something, friend. I'm glad that our church loves one another. We've got some new members around here, and every time I'm around, they say, you know, I think this is the friendliest church I've ever been around. I think they love people more than any church I've ever been. I just love our church. They become a part of it. So they got saved, and they got in, right, and they got in church, and they joined the church. And they just think it's the greatest place in the world. Amen. And some of you have been here about 10 years, and you're just saying, well, you know. So, you know, it's all right. It'll, it'll do in a pinch. It'll do when I'm, when I'm losing my kids to sin and I'm going to heart surgery. No, folks, it's, it's more than that. Jesus is more than an emergency ration. He's daily bread. <laughs> Amen. And I'm telling you what, He's enough. And He loves us no matter what. And folks, I believe that ought to be our attitude of a sample for Christ is that when we take that sample, it's a sample of God's love. God's forgiveness. God's mercy. Love. And I was talking to our sister right here yesterday on her front porch. She's rejoicing the Lord that her daughter got saved <laughs> last week. Amen. And I said, huh, uh, Sister, Sister Lachey, you're going to find out our church is friendly. And our church loves everybody. Just feel right at home. And she's not only that, I said, I got another daughter that she's, she's brought into her home. I thank God for people that do that. Helping out somebody that's, that can't handle them. And she says, I think she got saved last week too. I said, praise God. What did you preach, brother? That's great. Amen. I'll preach it tonight. I said, well, we'll, we'll find out. Well, should we get baptized? I said, no, wait just a minute. We'll make sure they mean it and understand it. Then we'll let them get baptized. But you know what thrilled my heart? Here's a mama that wants her children to follow through. Here's a mother that wants them to come back to Whitfield Baptist Church. I'll tell you what, it made me just want to go door to door a little more, praise God. That's how Brother John and Miss Linda found her. It works, don't it, Brother John? You're getting old, son. And he's still knocking on doors for that bus route. Thank you, brother. Still taking trailer parts. Still trying to build that bus route. Why? Because that's what Jesus would do. Because he loves little children. And he loves families that don't have a way here. That don't have mamas that care. They love it as a babysitting service. We'll take them. Because when they get here, they're going to find... There's a place where people are setting an example of God's love. There ain't no big shots in this church, no little shots. The land at the bottom of the cross is level. Amen? Ain't nobody more important. I'm glad my God's not prejudiced. I'm glad my God's not partial. I'm glad my God loved the son of a drunk as much as he loved the son of a of the governor and I got saved because some deacons kept teaching me the word of God when I was a little boy and saying God loves you what would be an example of love what else should we be what would be an example of spirit in spirit you know what that means even disposition I'm glad we don't fuss and fight around here I'm glad we don't pick sides and choose teams. And I've heard of people in Dalton, Georgia have fist fights in their business meeting. Can you believe that? We would never allow that. We'd just shoot you. No, not really. <laughs> no, no. I mean, fussing in the house of God? Not getting along in the house of God? 
picking sides and picking teams in the house of God. Folks, there ought to be a spirit of, of, of love, but a spirit of congeniality and a spirit of friendliness and a spirit of, of Christ in this place. Love and joy and peace. That's the disposition we ought to have. That little S means disposition. How's your disposition working this morning? Some of you ain't good unless you have 15 cups of coffee, Brother Howard. Amen. The disposition is bad. And I, now y'all got me hooked on hot tea. I knew it would. you'd get amen out of that. How's your disposition? Some people look grumpy all the time. You ought to see what I look at preaching. Praise God, I believe we ought to smile when we're a Christian. I believe we ought to be happy as a Christian, say amen. I'm not trying to pump up anything. We don't do that here. Praise God, we got something to be even in spirit. And then let me just say this, we ought to set an example in faith. Faith. That's the night I begged you not to lose the pioneer spirit of this church. Sometimes I get up on Saturday morning, I don't want to visit. And I said, no, I need to visit just like I was when I didn't know anybody else in this town. Not one soul. I need to knock on doors with desperation not to see a church make it or to have a next meal, but in desperation to know that there's people starving out there for the gospel and they're starving for somebody to love them and they're starving for Jesus. And we have the answer. We got the pardon in our pocket, not in our pocket, in our heart. And they're in captivity. And they're just crying out, please, have enough faith to knock on my door. Have enough faith to go visiting Sunday school teacher when I missed five Sundays in a row because Jesus didn't give up on you. Have enough faith to keep running that bus route when gas has gone up to $1.34. I don't know what diesel is. I don't want to know. Don't tell me. But folks, listen. We ought to have some faith. If there's one thing that we ought to be identified as, we ought to be believers. Amen? We ought to set the example of being a believer. God's shown himself powerful on our behalf. He has blessed us, even in this remodeling program. I can tell you stories of how God's paying for it. How God is providing. It's wonderful to be a part of God's economy and not trust budgets and nickels. And I believe in budgets. I'm going to present one to the deacons tonight, this afternoon. We need to get approved by you. But I want to say this, friend. I'm trusting God. And I want my neighbors to know it. And I want my children to know it. Last but not least, time's up. It says impurity. Folks, we ought to set an example. Impurity. One day while on a mission in the South Pacific, Butch O'Hara, they named the airport after him in Chicago. Butch O'Hara was a fighter pilot assigned to the aircraft carrier in the South Pacific. And one day while on a mission, he looked at his fuel gauge and realized someone had forgotten to top off the fuel tank. And unable to complete the mission, he turned around and headed back to the aircraft carrier. And as he headed back, he saw a squadron of Japanese Zeros heading straight for the American fleet. All the American fighters were out on a a sortie leaving the fleet virtually defenseless. He dove into the formation of the Japanese planes instead of going back towards the aircraft carrier in a desperate mood to divert them away from the fleet. And after a frightening time of air battle, the Japanese airplanes broke off their assault on the fleet. and Butch O'Hara, tattered fighter, limped back to the carrier almost out of gas, he was recognized as a hero and given one of the nation's highest military honors in O'Hare International Airport in Chicago is named after him. 
Some years earlier, there was a man in Chicago called Easy Eddie. And in those days, Al Capone virtually owned the city. Capone's mob was involved in bootlegging booze, murder, prostitution, and oh, Easy Eddie was Al Capone's lawyer. And kept Big Al out of jail, and in return, Easy Eddie earned a big money and lived like a king and had an estate so large it filled the entire city block of Chicago. But Easy Eddie had one soft spot, a son, whom he loved dearly. And Eddie saw his son had the best of everything, clothes, cars, good education. And despite Eddie's involvement with the mob, he tried to teach his son right from wrong. And Eddie wanted his son to be a better man than he was. Amen, daddies? There were two things Eddie could not give his son, a good name and a good example. Deciding that, deciding that giving his son these two things were more important than lavishing him with riches, Eddie had to rectify the, the wrong he had done. He went to the authorities and told them the truth and turned in Al Capone. Easy Eddie eventually testified in court against Al Capone and the mob he knew the cost would be great, but he wanted to be an example to his son and leave him with a good name. Within a year testifying against the mob, Easy Eddie's life ended in a blaze of gunfire on a lonely Chicago street. He had given his son the greatest gift he had to offer at that great price he would ever pay. What do these stories have to do with each other? Well, Butch O'Hara was Easy Eddie's. And Eddie was willing to pay the price to correct his mistakes to be his son's right kind of example, example in conduct and in character. And his son became a national hero and a great warrior and saved so many men that they named the airport in Chicago after his son. Let me just say this, men and ladies, Christians, your example lives on. And as Paul said in our text, he said, don't just be pure. And don't just have the right perspective and have great values. But he said, follow me and mark them and walk so as you have us for an ensample. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the message this morning. I pray it's been a message and not just a sermon and not just an outline. I just thank you for keeping me in Philippians 3 long enough to hear that message. Because Lord, if there's anything I want to do as a shepherd, as you acknowledge and exhort in 1 Peter 5, 4, that the shepherd should set the example for the flock. <clears throat> and so, dear God, help us to follow your example. Lord, I thank you for what a great example you set. Lord, we'll deal with that tonight. But Lord, I thank you, dear God, that we can keep our eyes and look for the Savior when all the things that get so dark and bleak around here, we can keep our eyes on our example the Lord Jesus Christ.